Morning, everybody. Good to see you all out today. It's always a difficult time of the year to get a congregation together sometimes, but it's good to see you all here today. And let's hope we get the sun that they're predicting for the next few days. Uh, Northern Ireland seems to be avoiding any of that sunshine that the south of England seems to get at this time of year. First of all, I'd like to welcome Ruth, the Reverend Ruth Craig, today. I missed her first appearance, unfortunately, with COVID. Uh, so you're very welcome, Ruth. And we look forward to hear what you have to say to us today. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just a notice about uh, the magazines. Methodist magazines are in the foyer. So please, if you uh, get a magazine, would you pick it up today as you're leaving? And next week, the Reverend Ken Connor will be leading us in our service. But I just want to, we all remember M Margaret Thompson's husband's funeral in the last week. And just to let you know, Margaret has sent us a card and I'm gonna read it out for you. The card itself is one that says, in big ways and small ways, some people make all the difference. Thank you. And Margaret has written herself on the card not only were prayers said, I know they were answered. The support the church family gave me is much appreciated. Praise God for answered prayers, Margaret Thompson. So our thoughts are still with Margaret at this difficult time, I'm sure, and we will continually pray for her. Okay, I'll hand over to Ruth, thank you. The psalmist says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. And we come today to acknowledge that he is a loving God. And we're going to join together in singing our opening hymn, O Heavenly King, look down from above. <laughs> Let us pray together. <clears throat> Loving Heavenly Father, we come and we want to praise you this morning for all that you are. We want to praise you for your greatness, for your power, your glory, your majesty and your splendor. And we come before you conscious of your awesome holiness and our own unworthiness. Gracious God, we come and we want to thank you for coming to us in Jesus Christ.
We thank you for the birth of the child, for the life of the man, for the words of the teacher and the compassion of the healer, and beyond all of these things for the death of the Saviour, for the life that death could not conquer, and supremely for the presence and power of Christ with us now, alive and active in our world. Father God, we would come and we would confess that we have sinned against you in thought and in word and in deed. We haven't loved you as we should and we haven't loved others as ourselves. And so we would come and we would ask your forgiveness. And we would thank you that through what you achieved on the cross in Christ, we can enter into your presence and we can have that wonderful assurance of sins forgiven. And so, Father, we would receive that from you now. And as we come to worship you, we would ask that you would remove every burden and every care from our minds, that with a joyful heart and an expectant spirit, we might seek your face and leave this place in the knowledge that we have met with the living God and heard from him through Jesus Christ, his son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Do you know, it's lovely whenever you come to a church and you actually have people that are prepared to do readings and doing prayers. And I am, as a minister, I am always grateful for that. So I'm going to ask Gwyneth now if she would come and read for us. The reading is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. For this reason... Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelations so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know this hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly, heavenly realms for above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one still to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. Thank you so much. So, You probably know my name's Ruth Craig. You probably don't know that much more about me um, because I was saying the first time I was here, that was the first time I'd ever actually been in the church. So I've never preached in Glenburn before. I'd never been in Glenburn before. So, um, but I'm Ruth. I've been a minister from, I I came out to Moira, I came out in Moira in 97. So I've served in Moira, in Lurgan. I've been in Donegadee and I was in Balnehinch before I decided to take early retirement. So just the early bit is very important, ladies and gentlemen, just so you know that. Um, I'm married. I'm married to Alan. Alan is also a Methodist minister. He came in um, much later than I did. And um, I've got three children, two girls and a boy. So that's a little bit about me, just so that you can, you know, get a a kind of idea. And I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to know you all better over this coming year. So... I don't think we'll have any children here today, but you know what? A children's address is always good, don't you think? And this is one that's good for all of us because it's a good reminder for me. I don't know about you. You know, often prayer can be an easy thing, and then there's times maybe whenever we can find it difficult to pray. 
for some reason or another. So I kind of thought there's a little exercise that I do with the boys and girls, and it's quite a good one, and it's a reminder for us as well. So hopefully you'll join in on this. But whenever we pray, generally we put our hands together like this, don't we? Or whenever we're younger, we put our hands together like this, and we tell the children to pray to put our hands like this. So I wonder if you would put your hands like this for me. And we're going to pray. So we're not really going to pray. I'm going to tell you because sometimes we can wonder, what can we pray for? So this is a reminder because if you look, the, th- the finger, or it's not really a finger, but the digit that's closest to you is what? Your thumb. And so the thumb can remind us to pray for those who are closest to us. So those that we love, our family, our friends, any, anyone that we think is really close to us and those that we love, the thumb can remind us to pray for those, right? So the next finger, what's it called? Pointer. I don't know whether, I think there's Rosemary as a teacher. I know whenever I was at school, my teachers used to turn around and say, don't point. But it's called the pointer finger. Now that finger can remind us to pray for those who point us in the right direction. So if you think like whenever we were younger, we would have had Sunday school teachers or BB or GB leaders or our parents or family, grandparents, anyone who pointed us in the right direction and told us how we ought to be. So our thumb reminds us to pray for those who are closest to us. The pointer finger reminds us to to pray for those who... You're listening. Excellent. So then the next one, the next one is the tallest finger. And that reminds us, and oh my goodness, don't we need to be praying this at the minute, that reminds us to pray for those in leadership. So, (coughs) I'll move on. I'm not just talking about government. We'll move on from the government very quickly. But others in leadership, like those in our own political situation, those in, in local leadership and everything else that try to do their best for us. So our thumb reminds us to pray for those who are closest to us. Our pointer finger reminds us to pray for those who point us in the right direction. Our next finger reminds us to pray for those in leadership. And then the next finger. Now, Rosemary plays piano. I'm picking on you a bit, Rosemary. Sorry, I don't mean to be. But Rosemary plays piano, so she'll maybe be able to help me out with this because I have been told, I don't play, but I have been told that this finger here is the weakest of all the fingers. I don't know whether that would be right or not. So this finger is the weakest of all of them. So that reminds us to pray for those who are weak, those who are sick, maybe not too well, maybe frail, anyone like that that we think are maybe just a wee bit just in need of prayer because they're just not at themselves. So we're nearly there. Thumb reminds us to pray for those who are closest to us. Pointer finger reminds us to pray for those who point us in the right direction. Tallest one reminds us to pray for those in leadership. The next one reminds us to pray for those who are weak. And finally, and scripture tells us that we're, we're, not, we're allowed to pray for ourselves as well. So whenever we've prayed for everybody else, then the wee finger reminds us that we can pray for ourselves as well. So one more time. Hands together, the thumb reminds us to pray for those closest to us. Pointer finger reminds us to pray for those who point us in the right direction. Uh, The tallest finger reminds us to pray for those in leadership. The next one reminds us to pray for those who are weak. And the last one reminds us to pray for ourselves. So hopefully you will remember that sometimes whenever you're maybe sitting and you're thinking, God, I'm not quite sure what, even saying, God, I'm not quite sure what to pray for is a prayer actually, but you know what I mean. Sometimes it's just a nice wee reminder that we can pray at any time in any way, but if we need a wee bit of a direction that our hands together can lead us and and help us in that. Let's pray together. Loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you're a God who loves us, a God who cares for us, and a God who wants us to pray constantly. So Father, we would pray that you would help us, just as the disciples asked Jesus all those years ago to teach us to pray, we would ask that of you as well. And Father, we would pray for the children of this church. We know there's none here today, but we would pray for them and we would pray, Lord, that you would continue to help them to grow in grace and knowledge of you day by day. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to join together in singing again a lovely piece. Father, I place into your hands the things I cannot do.
And now I'm going to ask David if he would come and lead us in our prayers for others. Thanks, David. Let us pray. Father God, as we worship and praise your holy name in the safety and comfort of this church building, we are reminded of our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world facing persecutions in places like northern Nigeria and Kenya and in India where persecution is rising at such a rapid rate. And of course China, Somalia and North Korea still the number one on the watch list for persecution against believers. Yet, Lord, despite all the the pain and suffering that they are going through, the name of Jesus is being professed by ever more people throughout the world. Lord God, we pray that you would strengthen the faith of your church. And as you bless them, may their enemies be blessed as you have commanded through them. We give thanks, Lord, that even in our parliament there was a meeting taking place on the Tuesday the 5th of uh, July with Open Doors, who are champions of the persecuted church, and many MPs were, were involved with that, and we give thanks for that. We continually pray, pray to you, Lord, for an end to the occupation of Ukraine, and that the war will cease and Russia will withdraw. We pray for all who are displaced, living in fear. God of peace, hear our prayers. We pray for all refugees, and indeed the millions in the different camps and townships, the likes of Lebanon and Turkey, that are still being uh, helped. Lord, direct governments and agencies of the world to bring an end to their plight. Great God, you reveal yourself to us through the wonders of the natural world, our home. Help us realize how important it is to preserve this natural world, that we, for future generations, can continue to learn of your greatness through its wonders. And through scientists, engineers, and scholars, new knowledge comes to light. May new developments in production of sustainable energy protect our fragile planet and promote the well-being of all peoples and all creatures. Lord, we pray for the awareness that we cannot sustain current aspirations of infinite economic gain on a finite planet. Lord, help us to live in such a way we respect all life, accepting we must reduce our demands in order to allow other forms of life to continue and flourish. Lord, we pray for all international, national and local leaders managers of companies that they would be guided by your spirit to make wise decisions about sources of sustainable energy for all. Father God, give guidance and wisdom to our politicians, both local and national. May they act with integrity, honesty, and mutual respect whilst working for the good of all. Lord, we pray for the people of our province will be sensitive towards one another at this time, that all parades and demonstrations taking place will be peaceful in a peaceful atmosphere. And Lord, we give thanks that recent years have been relatively peaceful. Lord, we pray your protection on the police, the fire service and ambulance over the next few days especially. And Lord, we pray for church unity for renewal and revival of faith in our land. We continue to give thanks for the the NHS and all frontline workers who have worked sacrificially for the whole community during the pandemic and under such constant pressure even now. And Lord, we pray for marginalized, especially homeless families of those who have recently died whilst rough sleeping on our streets. And Lord, we pray against all addiction. Lord, help them in Jesus' name. And gracious God, we pray for those who we know who are ill at home or in hospital, for all who are expecting or experiencing strength pain, and for those anxiety waiting diagnosis, treatment, procedure, or an operation. Lord, bring your healing and your peace. 
In Jesus' name. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Thank you, David. We're going to join together in singing again, God of all power and truth and grace. So I introduced myself a wee bit, but what I, I didn't tell you was that Alan at one stage, Alan has had different occupations, but at one stage he drove a bus. So if you ever drove to Dublin, you might have, he might have been your, your bus driver. Now I share that with you because there's a story that I read about a bus driver and a minister. And they were standing in line to get into heaven. And the bus driver approached the gate and there was St. Peter. And St. Peter said, oh, hello there, how are you? I believe you were a bus driver. And the bus driver said, yes, that's right, I, I was. And uh, he says, well, I'm in charge of housing here. So I think I found the perfect place for you. So he looked and he says, you see that big mansion up there on the hill? That's yours. The bus driver was delighted, needless to say. But the minister was standing behind listening to all this. And he began to stand a little bit taller. And he thought, well, my goodness, if a bus driver gets a mansion, what am I going to get? So he was well chuffed. And he goes up to Peter. And Peter turns around and says, hello, I believe you were a minister. And he goes, that's right, I was a minister. And yes, did all the things that ministers do. And Peter turns around and goes, welcome. I've got just the place for you. You see that shack down there in the, the valley? that's your house. Well, the minister was a wee bit put out, as you can imagine. And Peter had, hard, and Peter had hardly got the words out of his mouth whenever the shock minister goes, no, 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 hold on a wee minute. I was a minister. I preached the gospel. I helped teach people about God. Why does a bus driver get a great big mansion and I get a wee shack? Peter turned around and looked at him quite sadly and he said, well, he says, it seemed whenever you preached, people slept. But whenever the bus driver drove, people prayed. <laughs> now, I'm not making any allegations about my husband as a bus driver. But what I would like to do this morning would be encourage us all to remember how important prayer is. 
I don't want to put you to sleep. I want to remind you that we are given a wonderful gift through prayer. And Paul prayed for the church in Ephesians, and Gwyneth read that passage for us. And in that, te- in that text, Paul is praying for the Ephesians, what I reckon is probably one of the most important prayers that any believer can pray for another believer. That God would take them deeper and deeper into an intimate knowledge of himself. The West, I know I'm in a Methodist church, but the Westminster Catechism tells us that man's chief end is to know God and enjoy him forever. Paul knew and taught exactly the same thing, that same basic truth many years before. When he says in verse 17 of Ephesians 1, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation so that you may know him better. I wonder how many of us pray a prayer like that for ourselves. And maybe even more importantly, how many of us pray that prayer for one another and for those we know? When was the last time we prayed for spiritual growth for ourselves and for our fellow Christians? I wonder just how many Christians, and I include ministers and church leaders in this as well, how many of us truly, truly intercede for other believers and pray not just for things, and don't get me wrong, praying for those things are so important. If someone's bereaved, we pray God's comfort into their lives and we pray his presence. If someone's ill, we pray for healing. If someone is in trouble, we pray for them. And don't get me wrong, I'm not negating that. I'm not, that is really important and it's, we are called to do that. But what if we prayed not just for health or not for specific circumstances, but revelation in order that we might know God better? You know, I honestly believe that if we are to see our churches change and become full of Christians who are on fire for God, then this needs to be the prayer that we're praying. We need to be praying that God will give us an ever-increasing hunger for his word. And as we read that word, then we will be drawn closer to him as as we grow in grace and knowledge of him. And as that happens, we will be used by him to shine and bring his light into the world around us. I know it's important to pray that God will keep us free from harm and illness and will look after us. But sometimes I think it's even more important that we pray that God will give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So what Paul prayed for the Ephesians all those years ago, we can pray for each other. And Paul prayed that they would know three things as a result of knowing God. So what were they? The first one was that they would know the hope to which God had called them. It's knowing that God gives us hope in this life and hope that we will be with him in heaven in the lasting life that enables us to keep going. And the definition of hope in the Bible is very, very different from the common meaning of that word Paul wasn't using the word hope the way we would today. Sometimes whenever we say hope, it's kind of translated as wish. You know, oh, I hope it doesn't rain or you know, I wish it wouldn't rain or, you know. But hope in the scripture means, actually means expectant, sorry, confident expectation. Our hope in God can be sure because God is sure. And to some people, hope is something that's way out there somewhere and, and isn't really very obtainable because it's something to do with the future and we live in the present but hope ought to be meaningful to us because hope tells us that whenever we fail God picks us up again and again and again and he gives us chance after chance after chance there was a good Friday service in a little Baptist church in Bangladesh And they decided because it was Good Friday, they would show the the video. You remember the Jesus movie all those years ago? And they decided they would show that movie. The church was absolutely packed. The aisles were full of, of little boys and girls sitting the front. There was hardly space to move. And everyone got really emotional 
during um, the, the crucifixion scene. Everyone was sitting there, tears were in their eyes. They were so, they were just feeling it so deeply. And all of a sudden, wee boy kind of lost attention on the screen and started looking around at everybody. And for somewhere deep inside, he just thought, no, no, when he got up and he says, no, listen, listen, it's okay, I've seen the end. He gets up again. <laughs> you know, sometimes as Christians, we can live and we think too much about the, resurrect- or the, the, the crucifixion of Jesus and we forget about the resurrection and the ascension and the fact that Jesus is now sitting up there at God's right hand interceding for each one of us. God is alive. You know that very same cry that we cry on Easter Sunday, the minister goes, Christ is risen and the congregation goes, he is risen indeed. Do you know, sometimes I think we ought to be doing that every Sunday just to remind ourselves. So often I think we forget the hope that we have been given in Christ, not only for this world, but for the next. It's said that Martin Luther was so depressed one time for such a long period of time that his wife got fed up and she went upstairs, got changed and came down wearing black. And Martin looked at her and turned and goes, who's died? And she says, God has. And he turned around and says, don't be ridiculous, God hasn't died. And then she looked at him and she goes, well, do you know what? Act like it and live like it. You know, as we live our daily lives, are we fully aware of the hope that we have, the hope that God has called us to? And is it reflected in our day-to-day living? Paul prays that as we know the hope, that as we know God, we will know the hope to which he's called us. And that hope can actually affect how we live our lives. We need to be careful that whenever, you know, I'm going to tell you, it's not a, not a very, it's not a very endearing story, I have to be honest. There was one Christmas, I was, whenever I lived in Donegadee, and there was one Christmas, and you know what it's like coming up to Christmas, your head's all over the place, you're on the bike trying to get your groceries and everything else. And I was wandering around Donegadee, and the wee man in the corner who owned the fruit shop just turned around and looked at me and he goes, cheer up, it might never happen. And it suddenly made me realize, what was my face like? (laughs) Do you know, sometimes we can be so busy in our thoughts and in our thinking that we forget what our face is like. And actually, as Christians, sometimes we really shouldn't forget what our face is like because we should be filled with the joy of Christ. And it was a real challenge to me that time because we need to be careful of the kind of witnesses that we actually are for God. So the second thing was then that they would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And again, this reflects how we live our lives. So often we think that saints are those images on stained glass windows. But actually, whenever Paul talks about saints, he's talking about all Christians. Those who have received Christ into their life and, um, and those who trust him. And our inheritance then is what we receive as the children of God. What are the benefits of being a child of God? Well, there's a knowledge that we are chosen by God and that he sees us through Christ's eyes. So he doesn't see us as we are. He sees us as holy and blameless because he looks at us through the cross. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see all of our sinfulness. He sees us as people who have no sin because he looks at us through through the cross. Not only that, but there's the privilege of knowing that we have been adopted into his family. We are God's children. And there is a knowledge and assurance of sins forgiven. All of these things are ours because, and they're the inheritance that we have as the saints. Paul prayed that the Ephesians would would fully understand these benefits. And you know, in this life, we may not be able to fully understand them, let alone fully appreciate them. But we can continue to grow in our understanding of them. And if we are to live our lives as Christ would want us to live them, then we need to know who we belong to. Do we live like children of the king? Do we claim the authority that is ours in Christ? Have we truly received our inheritance and are we living in that knowledge? If we are, then we should more and more often have victory in our lives over those things that can pull us down and drag us down and hold us back from following him and being obedient to him. 
If we know God more fully, we will become more and more aware of all that is ours in Christ Jesus. And if we're praying that for ourselves and for others, what a transformation we might see. And then thirdly, Paul finishes his prayer by describing God's incomparably great power for those who believe. You know, knowing that we have hope and victory is all very well, but we need to know the power of God in our lives if we're able to do what God wants us to do. Now, I want us to think about this because what power, what kind of power is it that Paul is talking about here? If we read that scripture right as it's written, Basically, it's saying it's the same power that God used whenever he raised Christ from the dead. In other words, the power that we are talking about here is resurrection power. Paul's telling the Ephesians that everyone and everyone who's read that letter since that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us. How incredible is that? I wonder how often we truly believe that that power is available to us. I think one of the problems with Christians, and I include myself in this today, is that we no longer realize the kind of power that is available to us through the Spirit of God. There's a story about a small Oklahoma town, and it had two churches and one distillery. Now, the members of both churches constantly complained about the distillery. They didn't like it there. They thought it was bringing the the town down, the reputation of the town, didn't like it, wanted rid of it. Both of the churches complained that the distillery was giving the the community a bad bad name. But what made matters worse was the owner of the distillery was an outspoken atheist. And the church people had tried for years upon years unsuccessfully to get this shut down. Finally, they decided, I'm not quite sure why they didn't do this first, but finally when they tried everything else, they decided they would pray. So they got together one night, had a joint Saturday night prayer meeting where they were going to ask God to intervene and settle this matter once and for all. The church gathered on Saturday night, and interestingly enough, there was a horrendous thunderstorm that raged outside the church that particular night. And much to the delight of all the church members, Lightning hit the old brewery and it burned down to the ground. You can imagine next morning in church, both services had wonderful sermons on the power of prayer. However, the insurance adjuster notified the distillery owner that they weren't going to pay out for the damages because the fire was an act of God, which was an exclusion of the policy. So the distillery owner was so furious that he decided he'd sue both churches. He claimed that they had conspired against God to destroy his business. The churches, however, denied that they had anything to do with the cause of the fire. The presiding judge read these words. I find one thing in this case most perplexing. We have a situation here where the plaintiff, an atheist, is professing his belief in the power of prayer. And the defendants, all faithful church members, are denying that very same power. (laughs) You know, as we listen to that story, we can laugh because it is a funny story and we can think how bizarre it is. But I think then we need to re-examine ourselves and think, do we really believe in the power of prayer? God has made available to us the same great and mighty power that he used when he raised Christ from the dead. I think we need to be reminded of that time and time and time again, not just on an Easter Sunday service. Do we truly believe that that wonderful power is available to us? In fact, do we believe that we have the hope, that do we have hope in Christ? Do we believe that we are children of the King? And finally, do we believe in the amazing, wonderful power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is available to us to enable us to live our lives as God would have us live them? And you know what? If we do affirm these things and we do believe these things, then the next important question we have to ask is, are we praying for ourselves and are we praying that into other people's lives? And not only that, are we applying these things in our Christian life? 
Paul prayed that the church in Ephesus would know God more. He knew that if they knew God better, they would know the hope that was theirs in Christ. He knew that if they knew God better, they would know the true extent of their inheritance. Mm -hmm. And he knew that if they knew God better, they would know the kind of power that was available to them to enable them to live as God had commanded them to. We also need to be reminded of these things. We need to continue to keep asking God that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, might give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know him better. We need to continue to pray that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which he has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Let's pray together. Amen. Loving Heavenly Father, we come and we thank you for your word to us. And Father, we would ask your forgiveness for those times whenever we forget who we are in you. Father, help us to be reminded that you are a glorious Father who will give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and you do that so that we can know you better. But Father, maybe before we even need to do that, we would ask that you would kindle a spark afresh in our hearts. Give us the desire to know you more. That we might continue to pray that our eyes, the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened. That we would know the hope, that wonderful hope that you have called us to. Father, we pray that you would help us to know the glorious inheritance that we have in you. And we pray that whenever things do get difficult, that we can lean heavily into you and receive that incomparable great power. Father, help us to be reminded of who you are and who we are in you. Amen. Amen. We join together in singing once again, lovely peace, kind of in response to the sermon, all I once held dear, and the chorus of that, of course, is knowing, knowing you, Jesus. <clears throat>
share in the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. 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 Thank you.